Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to this lecture. Welcome to Dance Ox Virtual Summer School 2020. This is lecture seven. There is an audience here for dancing, ballet and the literary in 21st century America. I'm Megan Smith and today I'll be looking at this topic which I explored as part of my undergraduate dissertation in English literature here at Oxford, which was very kindly supervised by Sue Jones. So, to start, we'll be following the essential thinking from this Lincoln Kirstein quote, there is an audience here for dancing. In this quote, Kirstein was arguing for the place of a ballet inherited from Europe in the United States of the first half of the 20th century. But in this presentation, I want to argue that Kirstein's apologia for the undeniable relevance and contribution of ballet to American culture is also true when we are thinking about the place of ballet and dance within the realm of literature and literary theory. In essence, we are thinking about centralising ballet within places where it had previously been set to the side. In this case, that is centralising ballet not just within the geographical realm of America, but within the formal realm of literature. James Phelan's introduction to understanding narrative from 1994 began by thinking about which kinds of texts constitute fiction. He wrote, fiction has moved out from its home base in the province of prose to annex pieces of such surrounding territories as poetry, film, painting, music, and performance art. Indeed, ballet can be just as much a method of storytelling as can the written text. But they are very different forms and any discussion of their shared place under the umbrella of fiction must think about what is at stake in their confluence. 16 years have followed since Phelan's statement that ballet as a performance art is part of a burgeoning late 20th and 21st century concept of fiction as this pluriformal term. And largely we have maintained a long held sense of literature as an influence or a origin point for ballet narratives. For example, we have a legacy of various productions of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, but we don't have many novels based on Giselle. Furthermore, our current dominant conceptions and theories of fiction remain generally based on the notion that fiction is a prose text. So by looking at pieces of prose fiction which attempt to capture ballet in writing, we can reverse that assumed direction of influence in which literature informs ballet and consider how ballet can be a serious and profound artistic influence on literary fiction. So rather than merely say, as Phelan does, that ballet is a type of fiction, by looking at a work which seeks to co-mingle dance and text, we can begin to see that ballet demands literary theory to reconsider the very mechanics of fiction. So put simply, writing about ballet, trying to use words to tell a story as a ballet does through movement, alters the way we theorize a story. So let's make sense of this with a very specific example. John Haskell's The Complete Ballet, a fictional essay in five acts, first published in 2017. As suggested by its title, this book is deeply plural in terms of form, style, and subject matter. It is divided into five chapters, each focusing on one particular ballet, recounting its plot, analysing both the ideological and theatrical work of the ballet. And it also drifts into anecdotal asides concerning performance history or ballet's involvement in other art forms such as film. Even further than this, there is interwoven a parallel narrative set in the mode of L.A. Noir involving seedy strip clubs and threatening gangsters. So it's clear this is a very eclectic book, but by placing these multiple narratives alongside one another, the complete ballet asks the reader to really see the collisions and confrontations between each genre as they happen. Indeed, the narrative voice makes a claim to the reasoning and aims of the strange genre which combines prose and ballet. I'm trying to find for myself a version of life that expresses itself like dancing, like the moving body thinking itself into existence. 
From this quote, we can pick out two areas of fiction and literary theory and their relationship to ballet, which we're going to focus on today in our look at Haskell's text. Firstly, the fact that we have a narrative voice which is explicitly talking to the reader about its methods of storytelling signals those slightly ominous terms of postmodernism and deconstruction. And secondly, the focus on the body, particularly the performing body as it creates meaning, signals an engagement with Gay's theory. Okay, so before we look at these aspects of narrative theory and the influence of ballet on them in more depth, let's lay out our key questions for today. What is at stake for literary theory when a prose fiction text attempts to write ballet narratives? How might the deconstruction of text incorporate and be furthered by the tensions at play in a textual account of transient performing balletic bodies? And what work is done by the theoretical category of the performing body within narrative? So what is literary deconstruction? Closely linked to postmodernism, it comes generally from some key French theorists from the late 1960s and early 70s, Jacques Derrida and Roland Barthes, and has been exemplified within prose writing very quintessentially by John Barth. Two key aspects of this theory, which are played with by Haskell and which we'll focus on today, are self-consciousness and the breakdown of language and the notion of the intertext. Let's first look at the idea of self-consciousness. Two examples from John Barth's writing help sum this up. In the middle of telling a very linear narrative, the narrator takes an aside. Description of physical appearance and mannerisms is one of several standard methods of characterization used by writers of fiction. And he also questions the capabilities of language. To say that Ambrose's and Peter's mother was pretty is to accomplish nothing. Now look at this quote from Haskell. When I say the story of my ballet, I'm referring to what they call romantic ballet. It's doing very much the same thing. Such metafiction, such awareness of the act of storytelling is very reminiscent of deconstructive fiction. But as we have discussed, Haskell's writing about ballet, it doesn't just take from literary theory. Literary theory is not the origin, but it uses ballet as a way of enriching these extant theoretical structures. So, the first chapter of the Complete Ballet focuses on La Sylphide. The first sentence sets out narratorial self-consciousness from the off. The story of my ballet begins in a large house. Immediately, the initial ballet story addresses the narratorial scaffolding which produces the scene. Rather than just be in the large house, the reader is shown an artificial, or at least narratorially mediated, setting of the scene. Are we in, are we in a large house, like the picture on the right, or in a house which is actually part of a stage set, like the picture on the left? As the initial scene of La Sylphide continues, the role of James comes to the foreground. He is described as sleeping, and we can't know for sure, but he's probably dreaming. And quote, a thin young ballerina playing the role of the sylph, end quote, is what he's probably dreaming about. The reader here is in a strange interstitial space. They are privy to the interiority of one of the ballet's characters, but this is invaded by the artificial performative nature of role-playing on the ballet stage. Again, do we have a real self, as on the left, or a ballerina, as on the right? It's a question of a field of vision. Do we see James and the self as real, complete characters within a story, or shallow roles played by real dancers? Haskell's narrator operates self-consciously, deconstructing their own storytelling by exposing the way that the characters of the stories are actually just roles played by dancers. As in this picture, we have an odd mixture of a real setting filled with dancers playing roles. The approach to use of language is also worth noting. Remembering Barth's narrative voice, which was skeptical about the ability of the word pretty to describe Ambrose and Peter's mother, 
Haskell's narrator adopts this approach, but he uses it as a way of structuring and propelling the plot of the ballet. Crucial difference. For example, when describing James running away from Effie to follow the sylph, Effie's response is explained through unpacking the language that the narrator himself is using. But Effie can't listen. James is running away from me. That's what she thinks. And the root of distraught is to tear apart. And she tears herself away, running back into the church. Here, by tracing the etymology of the word distraught, which is implied as describing how Effie feels, the narrator arrives at the words for what she actually does next. This creates a curious nexus between language, feeling and movement in which self-conscious meditation on the meaning of words provides a bridge between a character's emotion and its physical manifestation. This is surely significant for dance as a corporeal mode of, of expression. The narrator assumes the mode of self-awareness popularised by deconstructive fiction in order to set up a way to think about the narrating methods of ballet performance. Moreover, it appears that this is then not just a use of deconstruction, but a kind of answer to the concerns of deconstruction. Language for Haskell is not a cluster of various competing meanings related to various discourses which renders it almost useless but a kind of conduit for describing how ballet's movement relates to character development. This is an odd case where deconstructive approaches to language are made to be useful to conventional linear narration. In other words, because the narrator is self-aware about the words they use, they maintain the causational logic of the story. So we come to our second aspect of deconstruction, the intertext. Parallel narratives and intertexts are essential to the complete ballet. In this case, Haskell responds to the deconstructive notion that everything is a text and everything in our experiences is bound up with a web of discourse. This quote from John Bar R Roland Barth sorry, is quite heavy, but its key points have been highlighted. The text is woven entirely with citations, references, echoes, cultural languages, which cut across it through and through in vast stereophony. Barth is essentially saying that all texts are made up of other texts, and these references are almost constant, but not necessarily explicit or even deliberate. In the complete ballet, this aspect of literary theory is very consciously played with. The book evaluates intertexts in its own structure of a series of interwoven parallel texts, Remember the ballet stories, the L.A. Noir story, the pieces of biography of artists of various media, ranging from Rudolf Nureyev to Joseph Cornell. These are woven together through a particular shared image which crops up across various narratives. One of these is the image of wings, introduced in the descriptions of the ethereality of the sylph, but then applied elsewhere. So the narrator explains that we all have them, vestiges of what birds have. And then the L.A. Noir narrator later on describes their initial job as a masseur with, I move my fingers up her back to the place where our vestigial wings attach. And later, the threatening arm of Cosmo the gangster spreads across my latissimus. It is interesting that these connections are made through sometimes quite jarring and technical language of the body. The latissimus is conspicuous as precise anatomical vocabulary. So here, intertextual connections, the link between these parallel narratives, are formed by recurrent use of language of the body, which sticks out kind of uneasily in the text to make you notice it. So intertextuality is dressed up as being decidedly interbody. If Derrida calls everything a text and human experiences of life are made up of colliding texts and discourses, the complete ballet finds its interconnectedness as derived from a colliding web of bodies. External intertexts are also important. The narrator of the ballet stories draws on the idea of myth and desire when explaining the disjunct in that earlier conundrum of the sylph, the real sylph or the role-playing ballerina. He says, like any myth, a great ballet expresses both my desires and the afflictions that follow. 
The narrative voice has already shown an implicit and sophisticated awareness of Bartesian and Derridaean deconstruction, and later will engage keenly with gaze theory and even explicitly mention Michel Foucault. So despite no explicit reason to assume the text is aware of this obvious Freudian theory, which it is parroting, the fact that Haskell has used so many famous theorists already makes it hard to imagine that this is not a deliberately silent use of the intertext. This is more sensible in the context of the book's epigraph, which quotes George MacDonald, the Scottish mythopoetic fantasy writer, influence for Lewis Carroll. Indeed, fantasy and myth are consistently important themes in Haskell's text. But the quote chosen from MacDonald is one of his sober Christian tracts entitled On Duty, which, although it has a kind of thematic relevance to the liveliness and the ephemerality of dance, it's quite at odds with what actually is contained in the text. So the previous deft use of intertextuality makes this slippage feel crafted. It creates a sense of displacement where meaning comes through an interpretation of the text via things with which it is associated. There seems to be a strain to create meaning by the use of intertexts and often by intertexts which are only alluded to or briefly passed by, assuming a reader's knowledge which allows meaning to be embedded within the unsaid. The notion of meaning generated by allusion, by gesturing towards something which is not directly expressed, is an interesting poetics for the written expression of dance. Hence, once again, it's dance and the body which are now evaluating theory of the word. Finally, bodliness becomes part of the complete ballet's narration by a lengthy preoccupation with the issue of gazing. It is in the central chapter of the book, this one focused on La Bayadere, where this engagement with another literary theory comes into play. Gaze theory comes from the work of Laura Mulvey, who coined this term and definition, scopophilia, the pleasure in looking in which the determining male gaze projects its fantasy onto the female figure, which is styled accordingly. And later expanded to write that, under an active male desiring gaze, objects become symptoms referring back to the psyche, as it robs them of their true nature as material things and gives them a new meaning and significance. So let's look at how this plays out in Haskell's writing. This scene describes the character Rachel, a dancer at one of the seedy clubs in the L.A. Noir. She was a stripper, and I was aware enough to know that I was attracted to her, and also that what I was attracted to was my idea of who she was, what I saw not just with my eyes, but with my mind. Firstly, the narrative voice is aware of themselves as a desiring male gazer and that they are narrating via this gaze. But secondly, and more intriguingly, Rachel desires to be more than a desirable object. When I took a seat, she started talking to me about dancing and about her desire to be seen as something other than a desirable object. But the idea of desire has just been linked by the narrator to this idealisation, this male gaze of seeing with the mind rather than the eyes. So whilst desire from gaze theory informs the narrator's vision of Rachel, desire is also made pertinent to Rachel being seen beyond an objectified sexual ideal. Desire is therefore a psycho-visual practice, and any desiring gaze can transform objects. For Haskell, Mulvey's symptomatic objects can invoke the transformative powers of desire in reverse and desire away such a penetrating gaze. The separation of objects of desire in the mind and real embodied people is clearly interwoven with the Labayadere story. The love triangle of Salor and the two women, Nikia and Gamzati, is described through the male gaze of Salor. And although images of Nikia appear in his mind, they're just images. And images can trigger excitement, but he doesn't need images because Gamzati, a real person, is right in front of him. Here, the imagined image of Nakia is unnecessary because of the real presence of Gamzati. Most of the drive of the romantic plot of this ballet, as we know, comes from offsetting the ideal 
Nakia against Gamzati, whose attraction comes from partly the fact that she's actually there. So, the complete ballet furnishes it that of looking with ideas from gaze and body theory. Again, using it. But there is a further element of Mulvey's writing which is integral to how the complete ballet deals with looking. Mulvey claimed in Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema that the place of the look defines cinema, the possibility of varying it and exposing it. Haskell explores the possibility that the place of the look can also investigate experiences of spectating ballet. The, nar the narrator explains Solor's feelings as they simultaneously explore the space of the theatre. He does love both women, and he still believes that somehow it might still be possible to be with both of them. And while he's thinking this, in the wings, either Gamzati's father or Gamzati's maid conceals a snake in a basket of flowers. So whilst the narrator is concerned with Salor's gazing in terms of the projection of male desire onto a female object, this is complicated by the introduction of the theatre's wings. Here, the narrative programme of the ballet is also taking place off stage, although logically the spectators are confined to the theatre's visual frame, the proscenium arch. Therefore, the issue of gazing circles back to viewpoint and the slippage between dancer and character, as we've seen earlier in the presentation. The final tragic scene following Nakia and Salor's deaths is conceived as dependent on the machinery of the theatre, quote, and if the theatre has the right equipment, although he's dead, he's able to rise from the rubble, join Nakia, and the two of them, as the lights fade, are born aloft, end quote. The fading lights are implicated in the narrative's creation, but this ascension is not a certainty of the story. Whereas earlier deconstruction of language related to the expression of ballet, here the narrator pressurises the occasion of the theatre as a site for storytelling, reliant on machinery, apparatuses and frames. Now the link between the dancer who remains Salor whilst in the wings and Rachel who wishes to be more than a desirable object is the question of the agency of the performer within the performance space. Reader, narrator, spectator, even other dancers are grouped together as viewers who enact transforming, penetrating gazes upon the performer. They, in part, enact the story. Haskell's text pushes onto the edges of these stage spaces, adumbrating a concern with a spectacle which is not spectated. This is slightly different to Roland Barthes' question of the reader who creates the book as they read. But it does suggest that in ballet, there is a partial version of story which can occur under the constructing gaze of no one at all. So, to finish, Roger Copeland, arguing for the place of ballet in intellectual and aesthetic thought, claimed, we like to believe that existing bodies of knowledge exclude a knowledge of the body. Indeed, the work of Haskell demands the inclusion of ballet writing within literature, in inverted commas, and furthermore demonstrates that literary theory benefits from its evaluation and complication at the hands of those texts. Writing the ballet attempts to capture the experience of ephemerality, its drive for a textual poetics, for a non-linguistic medium, establishes the need for a cross-media approach to literary studies. By focusing on a corporeal artistic medium, we see how bodies are complex textual categories that keep the strictures of criticism in constant shift. But where does this project go next? The range or body of texts we treat in this way now needs a greater place in literary critical discussion. This presentation ends with a refashioned version of where it began with Phelan's quote, where Phelan argued that fiction now included the performing arts, we must now see that literary criticism must also take account for the work done by the performing arts within the written field. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, uh, please send these to the development office via email. That's to development.office at St. Hilda's, which is st Hilda's dot ox dot ac dot uk with dance ox in the subject line and we'll be answering those for you in due course 
Thank you very much.